Take your Bibles today and be finding the book of Proverbs. Find Psalms, take a right turn, and you'll find the book of Proverbs. Be finding chapter 3 today. Proverbs chapter 3. And we're going to look at a lot of other verses, and so you'll want to take some notes and be ready for your growth group tonight and, and uh, some of those verses, and I know there'll be a blessing. Now, our diving board verse is really uh, Galatians 5. Now, we've been in a uh, series on the fruit of the Spirit, and this is our text. Look at it up here, if you will. We'll put it up on the screen for you. And, uh, we think about the virtues of the Holy Spirit. We're thinking about the characteristics of the Holy Spirit, um, the fruit that should be born in our life. It's love, joy, peace, patience. Today, we're going to be looking at kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, self-control. All of these are fruits of the Spirit. And I was thinking how, again, how beautiful this world would be if we all bore those virtues in our life. Amen? I mean, if we could just be loving and kind and patient and have that peace and faithfulness and all of those things, what a wonderful world this would be. And certainly that's God's intention. Now today, we're thinking about kindness. And let's face it, um, man, the old world could use a dose of kindness. Amen? I mean, do you think that? Wow. Because it seems like what we have today is snarkiness. And it's amazing how smart alecky, I don't even know if that's a word, but smart alecky we can be. It just seems like it just it comes to us so fast. I was reading about a guy who was he was at a at the airport, he was buying some tickets, he was going to uh uh, flying to New York City, and he, she said, I would like a ticket to New York City. The, the agent said, all right, and she said, will you be uh, have, checking any bags? And he said, I've got three bags. She goes, you, so you want to check all three to, 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 to New York? And he said, no, ma'am, I'd like you to check one of them to Phoenix. I'd like you to check the other one to Seattle, and then send the other one to London. And the confused agent just kind of looked at him and said, sir, we, we can't do that. He said, why not? You did it last week. It's amazing how those things just kind of flow, right? I mean, just the smart aleckiness can just come to us just like that. But what we need to come is kindness. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. U.S. News and World Report did a survey, and I thought this was interesting. Get this, 89% of Americans think that rudeness and incivility or a lack of kindness has become a serious problem in our country. Almost nine out of 10 people, you line up 10 people, nine of them would say, yeah, people are just so rude today, uh, incivility and so forth, just, just downright mean and so forth. Three out of four Americans say it's gotten worse in the last 10 years. And I would certainly agree. My goodness, look at our leaders today. Is it any wonder that the people act the way they act when our leaders act the way they act? My goodness, they need a healthy dose of kindness. You've heard the phrase, haven't you? Kill them with kindness. Anybody ever heard that? Kill them with kindness. We've all heard that. And it's true. We can kill. Listen, did you know you can kill animosity with kindness? You can kill meanness with kindness. Uh, you, you can kill rudeness by just being kind. You, there's so many bad things you can kill if you would have the fruit of kindness in your life. And so that's what we want to look at. When I think about kindness, I know there are a lot of kind people, but I'm telling you, one of the, the most, the person who illustrated this the most, I think, she's gone to be with the Lord now, is Mother Teresa. I always love reading stories about Mother Teresa, her acts of service, and just her downright kindness to people, and especially the down and out. And I was reading this story, one stands out, I've shared it with you before, I'm sure, but uh, she was in Calcutta, India. I've been to Calcutta when we were in India, and, and I've seen the depravity there, and my goodness, I mean, people, I just, I mean, I was just I was just taken back. I was speechless when I saw the depravity. I saw people laying in the street. Several people. And I, you didn't know if they were dead or alive. And I asked. I said, well, they could be. I mean, it's not, it would not, be not surprising for some of them to be dead. I mean, it was just so depraved there. And so Mother Teresa spent a lot of her time in Calcutta and, or in India. And she was in Calcutta and she was treating lepers. And leprosy is just a horrible, horrible disease. And and, uh, but especially in Bible days, it was terrible. We'll talk about that in a moment. But she was, she was treating some of those people there. And a tourist, an American tourist, recognized her, 
said, man, there's Mother Teresa. <laughs> and so he went over to her. This was before cell phones and picture uh, cameras on our phones. He had a camera. And he went over to her and said, she was working on someone who had leprosy. She was ministering to him and treating him and so forth. And, and this tourist said, could I take your picture? <laughs> and she, she just kept doing what she was doing and said, yes, you, can, you have my permission. And what she was doing, he, he, pulled, he took the camera up and was going to take her picture, oblivious really to the guy. But when he put her in the frame of his camera, he saw what she was doing. She was treating a gaping hole on his face where his nose used to be. And that's what leprosy does. It just kills those extremities and it just, and they just to the point where they just come off. And so there's a gaping hole and she's wiping it and she's putting galls over that. And he was trying to take that picture. And I mean, his stomach was turning when he saw what she was doing. And he just went over to her and said, Sister, I wouldn't do what you're doing for $10 million dollars. And Mother Teresa looked at him, and here's what she said. Neither would I. Neither would I. Let me ask you something. Are you a kind person? You say, well, yeah, I think I'm, I'm pretty good. Brother Jeff, I've had trouble with a couple of these. had a little trouble with patience, and man, it was all over me on that one. But I tell you what, I really believe I'm a, I'm a pretty kind person. Well, let me just say this. Kindness is a lot like peace and patience that we've looked at already. What do we say about peace? You'll never really know if you have peace until you're in the midst of a storm. Guess what? You'll never really know if you're a patient person until you start having problems. And now get this. You'll never really know if you're a kind person until you have to deal with people who are unkind and mean and downright rude to you. That's when we, it's easy to love people who love you, right? It's easy to be patient people who are nice to you. And so listen, it's easy to be kind when someone's being kind to you, but that's not the real test. The real test is, am I kind to those who are unkind? Because listen, that is what God has done for us. Listen to this verse. Ephesians 4 verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Now look at this. Just as God in Christ has forgiven you. One of the hardest verses in all the Bible, I think, to obey. And I think if we would, we're honest today. And listen, sometimes we come to church and I've, I've looked at you already. And some of you put your church face on and, and you know, and you're ready. And, and we just kind of, we put on, we got a little face on and so forth. But I'm telling you, if we could take the mask off and really get honest, one of the most difficult passages for us to obey, all of us, is the passage that says, love your enemy. Now, come on. You're sitting there pretty holy. Oh, I have no problem with that. I love all my enemies. Oh, I just really love them. Just love them to death. Sure do. Here's what, here's what Jesus said. Luke 6, 35. Love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back from them. Then your reward will be great and you'll be children of the Most High. Because Now, look at this. Here's why you're supposed to love your enemies. Because he, God, is kind to those who are ungrateful toward him. God is kind to those who are wicked and who have rejected him and have ignored him. And so, listen, that's, that's just kind of the way it is. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to love those kinds of people. We're supposed to be kind to him. As a matter of fact, I didn't give it to you. I want to go back and give you a definition of kindness. Here it is. A little bit lengthy, but just, just listen to this. Kindness is lovingly engaging. Now, now, think about that word engaging, okay? It's interacting with someone. It's lovingly engaging others with a warm and friendly. I love those two words, warm and friendly. Don't you just love somebody who's warm and friendly? Consi co considerate and generous. Concerned and compassionate. They have that kind of a heart. And look at here, here it is. Ultimately, Treating others the way God has treated us. That's what kindness is. And that's why, that's why when we, we read that passage where it says, love your enemies, because that's what God has done for us. Love those who are unkind to you, because that's what God has done for us. Love those who, who, who are mean and, and, and ignore you, because listen, that's what God has done for us. And so it's easy, again, 
to have peace when there's no storm. It's easy to be patient when there's no problem. And it's easy to be kind when everybody's nice to you. But the, the, where the rubber meets the road is, are you kind with those who are unkind toward you? Do you treat them the way God has treated you? Are you kind to that boss of yours who seems to be pretty unfair and unrealistic toward you? Are you kind to that person who talks about you behind your back? And you know they do. Do you treat them with kindness? Are you, what about that person in your family? You love them, but you don't like them. You don't like what they do. You don't, know, you don't like how they act, and you don't like their personality, and they just kind of, just something just kind of rubs you wrong, man. But listen, let me ask you something. Are you kind to them? You say, Brother Jeff, those people like that, they don't deserve it. Listen, did we deserve the kindness of the Lord? He says, treat them the way I've treated you. You say, well, I, those people who are mean to me, the people who talk about me, and the people who are rude to me, and all, I just, I, I can't be kind to them. Hey, guess what? I can't either. That's why this scripture says, surrender to the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit produce peace and love and joy and patience and kindness through you. We do it when we're surrendered to the Lord, okay? The wisest man who ever lived was a guy by the name of Solomon, and he wrote the Proverbs, and that's where we are today. And so I want to read a passage. There's a lot of verses. I'll mention several of them in Proverbs that talk about kindness, but let's look at one uh, to to start with. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, and let's start reading in verse 3. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. In other words, don't let kindness leave you. Don't let kindness depart from you. Bind it, bind kindness around your neck. Write it on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. So verse 3, do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Listen, there's nothing that people want from you more, need from you more, and will enjoy receiving from you more than kindness. I'm telling you, you're going to encounter people today who need a kind word, who need a kind deed. And the question is, are you going to be kind? Are you going to surrender to the Spirit and let kindness flow from your life? Proverbs 19, verse 22, here's what Solomon said. What is desirable in a man is kindness. God says, what I desire in a man and a woman, a boy and a girl, what I desire from you is kindness. He said, that's what I want to see in your life. Wow. Wow. That's what God said, okay? So, what, what, what does it look like? Let me give you three things today. And these are pretty practical. These are really, really simple. And so you might jot them down, hopefully talk about them a little bit tonight and explore some ways that you can be um, kind to one another. Number one, practice kindness in what you do. Practice kindness in what you do. Now, when you think of the life of Jesus... He was, he had three years where we call it his public ministry. And he was on this earth, he was doing, he was interacting with people every single day. And the Bible talks about how people just surrounded him and they were pushing up, getting close, wanting something from him. I want something to eat from you. I want a healing from you. I want a word with you. I want, and listen, he, he, he had people around him all the time. Unless he would slip away by himself to pray. But other than that, he was people around him. His disciples needed things constantly from him. And so you think about the disciples wanted things from him. Pharisees, where he was meeting with Pharisees, he met with Roman commanders, uh, leaders in the Roman army. He met with other religious leaders. He was meeting with all kinds of people. But one, one incident, and I'm sure it happened many, many times, but there's one incident in the Scripture that really spoke to me, and, and, and what it just exudes to me is kindness. And it's when Jesus met with the little children. Do you remember that passage? Just just listen to the scripture because it paints a really beautiful picture. Mark chapter 10, verse 1. Getting up, Jesus went from there to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And notice this phrase, crowds gathered around him. Okay, so we just painted that picture. I mean, they're all, they're surrounding, they're, they're pushing in on him and so forth. But then notice the next word. Again. In other words, they did it all the time. They crowded around him again and again and again and again. And so all of these, what we would say, people, these adults, these leaders, these, de- the, these uh, disciples, all these people were needing things from him. Okay? 
And so it says, and according to his custom, he once, he once more began to teach them. And the people were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, now look at this, he was indignant. That means he was angry. He got mad. He got his righteous anger. It wasn't a sinful anger. It was a righteous anger. He said, man, don't do that. Don't stop those kids from coming. Look what he says. Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. And he took them in his arms. That is, he took them up. He hugged them. And he began blessing them, laying his hands on them. Think about that. This same Lord who walked on water, who healed the sick, raised the dead, fed the multitudes, he had time for the little children. (laughs) Isn't that good? I mean, this would be a great time if somebody would think of it as to write a song. Because when I see that picture and you see those, all those children coming to him and him taking time to be with them and hug them and, and touch them and bless them, and, and it just makes you want to say Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are what? Precious. Man, they're precious in his sight. Jesus loves all the little children of the world. And so he takes, he takes those kids up into his arms and he just blesses them. And the word that jumps out to me is I, is I picture that in my mind. And him getting angry at the disciples said, don't stop them from doing that. Look, hey, come on. Hey, little guy, come on over. Bring them up. Bring them. Bring them. Bring them. Let them come to me. When I see that and I see him sitting down talking to them and loving on them and touching them and hugging them and blessing them, man, I think of kindness. I think of kindness. It reminded me of a story. By the way, let me just ask it this way. How many of you remember the first election you were old enough, presidential election, that you were old enough to vote in? We all remember that, right? Your first one. I mean, you turn 18. Mine was in 1980, and it was uh, Ronald Reagan was running for office. And by the way, before anybody emails me or calls me, I'm not being political, okay? I'm not, no, that's not what this is about, so don't get mad at me. Just hear me out first, okay? All right. And so Ronald Reagan was running for office. He was not president at this time when this, this incident happened. He was governor of California. Michael Deaver, his chief of staff, tells this story. And he, they were in North Carolina for a rally. They were having a rally and so forth and... and um, you know, running for president. And there was, there were some blind kids, just like they had a, they had the podium, the stage and all this. And there were some blind children behind the stage. And the lady who had brought them there to hear him speak, got work, went to up to one of the aides of govern, then governor Ronald Reagan and said, Hey, would it be all right? Would, would, would the, would Ronald Reagan come and talk to these children? After, after the rally or something. And so that aide came over to Michael Deaver, who was the chief of staff for uh, Governor Reagan at that time, and, and gave him the request that, hey, there's some, some blind children back here, and the lady who brought them here wants to know if you might want to come over and just speak a word to them after the rally and so forth. And, and here's what Reagan said. He said, I will do it on one condition. No photographers and no reporters. Now think about that. A presidential election. I mean, today they stage those kind of things so they can have the photo op. Hey, do you see me rubbing this head of this little kid? You know, that's the way they do it now. But he said, no no photographers and no reporters. They said, okay, sure, that's great. So they waited until the the rally was over and all the reporters got on their bus, photographers on their bus, and they had left. And they they brought, and and uh, Governor Reagan at that time went over there to those little children. and And he went and he sat down on the curb. Now think about that. They're in a parking lot. And he sat down on the curb. And he began to talk to those little blind kids. They were 9 or 10 years old. And so they all just began to ask him questions, and he answered their questions. And then he said, guys, I have a question for you. How many of you would like to come up here? I can see what you look like, but how many of you would like to come and touch my face and feel what I look like? And they kind of squealed, and they said, yeah, we would love to do it. We want to do that. And so, sitting on the curb, again, no photog- there's no pictures of this. Michael Deaver said, it's, just, it's been embedded in my mind, a picture of my mind. I can still see it. He said, he's, this is 25, 30 years later, he said, I can still see it. Those little kids came up there to Governor Reagan and began to just touch his face, just, just to feel what he looked like. 
And he said, as I looked over there and I saw each one of those little children coming and touching his face and smiling and, and just with so much joy in their heart, Michael Deaver said, I looked at the man who was doing that and all I could think was what a kind man he is. What a kind man. And so kindness is exhibited in the things that we do, things we do. Okay, but listen, very practical, very simple. But then number two, not only do we practice kindness in what we do, we profess kindness in what we say. See, it's not just what we do, it's what we say. Now, let me give you a verse. This is a great verse. You'll want to jot this one down and talk about it tonight in your group. Proverbs 16, verse 24, kind words are like honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. In other words, he's saying kind, wo- kind words can bring healing. Kind words just meet the, the needs of, a, of the deepest part of our soul and who we are. And so here, I go back to the picture of Jesus. Think about him there. He, all those people are crowding in, crowding in, and they're, and, the, and they're trying to bring some of the children. Can't you see some of those mamas saying, man, I want to take my... Listen, the adults were you know, adults were the main thing. They would push the children and even the women off to the side and say, let, let, let's, let the men talk and so forth. And so here's some of these ladies trying to bring the children. And he, he says, yes, you let them come. And notice what he does. Now, this is important. Again, it's, it's not just what we do, but it's what we say. The scripture says he took them, he, he touched them, he hugged them, what we might call hug them, put his hand on their shoulder and patted them and rubbed them a little bit. And he just loved on them. But now listen, that's what he did. But now listen, don't miss this. Go back to that passage, and it says, and then he blessed them. That's what he said. He spoke blessing on them. He encouraged them. He spoke kindness to them. And so, listen, it's not just what we do. It's not not just practicing what we do. It's professing what we say, okay? So let me ask you a question. Have you ever, if you're like me, have you ever missed an opportunity to be kind to someone? Come on. Man, I have. And I can kick myself and I say, man, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you, why didn't you just speak a word to them? They needed it. So, and so we, we miss that. And listen, we miss an opportunity to speak healing to them in their bones and, and kindness to their soul, that, that verse says. And so we miss that opportunity. But now let's take it a little bit further and it gets a little bit harder. So we would, most of us would probably say, yeah, I've missed those opportunities. Okay, now let's not talk about missed opportunities. Let's talk about taken opportunities. How many of us have taken the opportunity when someone's been mean to us? When someone has said something rude to us, disrespectful to us, spiteful to us, and have taken that opportunity to return good for evil with what we do and what we say? So missed opportunities over there, but taking opportunities right here. My guess is if we're missing opportunities over here, we're not taking advantage of those opportunities right here when people are being mean to us and rude to us and so on and so forth. Well, that's just, I think it's, our, it's, it's just the flesh within us. If somebody does something mean to us, what do we want to do? Man, we just want to do to them what they've done to us. We want to be mean back. How many of you, how many of you remember cartoon Sluggo and Nancy. Anybody remember them? You know, they weren't one of my favorite. A lot of you remember them. Well, here's a picture of them. And, uh, and Nancy, let me just kind of set the stage. Nancy was, she was kind of prim and proper, you know, and she was raised right in manners and this and that. And so, but now Sluggo, you can see the patches and everything. He was raised on kind of on the other side of the track, so to speak. He was kind of a rednecky, you know, that kind of a guy, you know, a little bit gruff and so on and so forth. And so the cartoon strip went like this. Sluggo came to Nancy and said, um, you know, that new kid at school, I, I don't like him. He's a big fat head. And Nancy was taken back. And she said, don't call him that. You don't call people names. I would never, I would never call someone that or call them names. Don't do that. And Sluggo felt bad. He said, well, I just didn't like it when he said you were stupid looking. Nancy looked up and said, what else that big fat head say? <laughs> Amen. Listen, that's our normal response. What, you know, what else? 
And, and we just respond with, with unkindness to those who are unkind with us. But again, we're to treat them the way God has treated us. Listen, I'm going to give you two verses. Man, they're tough. Luke 6, verse 28, bless those who curse you. Man, we could stop right now, have an invitation. If this altar ought to be filled with people confessing because we don't bless those who curse us. We usually curse those who curse us. But how do I know I'm a kind person? Because I bless those who curse me. Pray for those who mistreat you. I go back to the Ephesians 4 passage. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as, here it is, God in Christ has forgiven you. Listen, he's kind to us. We need to be kind to them. We need to bless those who curse us. Marcy and I were taking a Jeep ride here probably a couple of months ago. We went up to, rode up to Mount Nebo and rode around, looked around. It's always fun to go do that, hike and stuff. And so we're coming back. And a lot of times what we'll do on a Saturday, especially if we're, we've taken a ride and we're in Dardanelle, we'll just stop at the Walmart Dardanelle. Instead of ours, it's always so crowded on Saturday. It's crazy. And, and so this was usually not as many people. Well, on this day, it was pretty crowded. But we, we went in there anyway. And so we just needed a few things. And so we got them. And, and so we were uh, going to the little self-checkout, you know, just had three or four things. But it was even full. I think there were like four little registers, maybe five. And, and so we were, you know how you do, you kind of stand back and wait for one of them to open up. And so that's what we were doing. And there was a, there was a young girl there. She was probably, I don't know, 20, 22, three years old. She's working. And so we were waiting and she was back there, you know, kind of scrambling. And then so one of them opened up. And so she just motioned at me and said, here's one but over here. And so I, I, I just smiled, walked over there and said, well, thank you. Appreciate that. How are you doing today? And I, I said a few things to her. And here, here's the thing. I don't even remember what I really said to her that day. But I do remember what she said to me that day. She looked at me and she said, thank you for smiling and being nice. And I was, I was taken back. I said, well, well, sure. Sounds like you might be having a tough day. She goes, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe how mean people are, how rude people are. All you're doing is trying to help, and they're just mean. I said, yeah, it's bad. She goes, five minutes ago, I had a little a lady. And you would have looked at her, and you said, look at that sweet little old lady. That's grandma. That's grandma. And so I went over, and a lot of times grandmas have trouble with all those machines. And so she said, I went over to help her. And I'm telling you, she was the meanest, rudest most spiteful person I've ever met. It's just, and she was, it was just unbelievable. And I could tell, and I just said, well, listen, you keep smiling, kill them with kindness. I said, you're doing a great job. God bless you. I'm telling you, I thought she was going to cry. I thought she was going to break down and cry right there. She said, thank you. And thank, this, it's, it's amazing. A simple thing is a smile would make a difference. A kind word that would make a difference. And it's, listen, it's not just what we do, it's what we say. It's what we say. Kindness. Number three, practice kindness in what you do, profess kindness in what you say, but promote kindness in how you live. Now, let's go back to our verse. And what I want to do is I want to give you three words, phrases that, that Solomon tells us to do as it relates to kindness, okay? And so I've just, I've just written these three words maybe to help us remember it, okay? When it comes to kindness, number one, weave it. Weave it. What do you mean weave it? When something, it's just, it's woven into you. It becomes a part of you. Look at what he says, verse three. Don't let kindness leave you. In other words, just like thread in a, in a shirt or a dress or whatever, that thread weaves back and forth and it's tightly knit into that fabric, that, and produces that fabric, that's the way kind. Don't ever let it leave you. Weave it into every aspect of your life. That's what Solomon's saying. Number one, weave it. Number two, wear it. Look at verse three. He says, bind them around your neck. That is, wear, the, wear it. Wear kind. What does that tell us? It says, listen, other people ought to be able to see it. I, I used that word engage earlier in the definition. We ought to engage other people. They ought to be able to see kindness and sense kindness and experience kindness when, when they encounter us. Why? Because we're wearing it in our life. We're wearing it just like we would wear a necklace. We put that out there for people to see and experience. Kindness ought to be saw, seen and experienced in our life. So weave it, wear it. Number three, ride it. Look at what he says. 
Write them, write kindness and truth on the tablet of your heart. Write it. In other words, Solomon's saying kindness needs to be written in the deepest recesses of who you are. Do it in your heart. Why is that? Well, listen to this verse. This is what he goes on. He says in uh, Proverbs 4, verse 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. That's why he says, write it in your heart because what's in your heart is going to flow from your life. And so write kindness in the depths of your heart so that it will flow out of your life and, and other people experience. Here's how Jesus said it, Matthew 12, verse 34. For whatever is in your heart determines what you're going to say. So he says, put kindness in your heart so you're going to say kind words. Adrian Rogers used to put it this way. He said, man, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Amen? Man, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. And Solomon's saying, put kindness down in the well. Put kindness down in your heart so it'll come up in the bucket and, and touch other people. That's what kindness is. You ride it onto the depths of your heart. Now, here's the thing about kindness. It's really like patience. Remember what we said in, in describing love? You're not going to be patient without love. Hey, guess what? You're not going to be kind without love. It's because here's what 1 Corinthians 13 says, verse 4. Love is patient. And love is what? It's kind. Listen, if you're, if you're loving, you'll be patient and you'll be kind. If you're kind, you love. If you're patient, you love. That's what he's saying. And we can do it in the most simple of ways. Listen, sometimes it's just a pat on the shoulder. Sometimes it's a hugging somebody's neck. Sometimes it's... It's a kind word. Sometimes it's as simple as that lady in Darnell. Sometimes it's as simple as a smile. Listen, do you smile when you see people? When you encounter, do you smile? Or are you just kind of a sour puss? I tell you what, let's do. Do we have time? What time? Let's take, let's, let's just take a little, let's practice. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and just smile. Turn to them and smile. We're not going to finish this message until you do it. Okay. That... Some of it was pretty sincere, and some of it was pretty fakey. <laughs> pretty fakey. Thank you, Em. That's a good smile. Thank you, girl. Listen, I, I've given you some things. I th or did, did you get in the bulletin? I didn't really see. Did we get the, the acts of kindness in your bulletin? Did you get those? Okay, good. Thank you. Listen, I want you to, I want you to be kind to people this week. That's your homework assignment. I want you to be kind to someone. Pick some of those things. You can probably come up with your own. But listen, try to do something once a day. We're going to, listen, here's your assignment. Once a day, I'm going to do one of these things. Man, I hope you do it a lot more than once a day. But pick some of those things, do it with your children, and say, we're, here's our assignment. We're going we're gonna to let kindness flow from our life this week. On Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, all the way through, we're going to do it, okay? And then you come back and talk to your growth group about it next week. Come write me, send me an email, tell me what you did. Uh, let us know. But listen, be kind. Listen, I'm going to say, you're going to encounter people today, tomorrow, who need something done in kindness, something said in kindness. You will encounter them, and I pray you'll be a blessing to them. I want to go back to Jesus real quick. Think about, there's a passage. It's a, it's a remarkable passage. Mark chapter 8, and, and Jesus is talking to, a leper comes up to Jesus. And here's what he says. Now, you remember the passage. So just remember, he comes up and he said, Lord... It's the most amazing passage. He says, if you are willing, you can heal me. If you're, and listen, by the way, leprosy was an awful, it was the AIDS of the Bible days. Man, if you had, if you had leprosy, they put you out over by yourself. Listen, if you, had to, if you walk down the street, you say, unclean, unclean. And so people would just get away from you. Listen, the pain was bad, but the isolation and the rejection was even worse of leprosy. And so this man runs to Jesus and he said, if you're willing, you could, you could cleanse me. You could heal me. And here's what Jesus said. Matthew 8 verse 3, amazing verse. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and he said, I am willing. Be clean. And he was cleansed of the leprosy. You say, well, why was that such an amazing verse? Man, we, we read all the time, healed a lame man and a blind man and a leper. He did it all. I mean, what's so, what's so amazing about this one particular one? Look at it again. He reached out his hand and touched the man. Nobody did that. Nobody did that. It reminded me of a story. Dr. Paul Brand, he was a leprosy expert. He, he dealt with people who had leprosy, and he was in India. 
And I can remember when I went to India, Danny went to India, and we, we go to these leper colonies, and that's what they did. You couldn't live with everybody else. They moved you out, out away from everybody. It was a colony, and we, we spent an entire day there ministering to people who had leprosy, sharing the gospel and treating their wounds. And the thing is, it can be, it can be healed. It's, it's, it's a disease, and that can be cured. But anyway, so many of them, and they, they don't have their fingers. They don't have their feet, their toes, or whatever. And that's the, that's the pain of leprosy. You could step on glass or a nail and never even know it because it deadens your nerve endings. You don't even feel it. And you're walking around with a screw or a nail in your foot, and you don't even know it. And it continues to do damage. That's what leprosy does. But again, it's not the physical pain. It's the emotional pain that's even worse. Dr. Paul Brand was, visiting, uh, was treating a young man, and he looked at him and so forth, and he had his medicines and so forth, and he, he, he reached over, and, he, and he, he, was, he was having to go through a translator, and he looked down at the man, he put his hand on his shoulder and said, hey, listen, it's, it's going to be okay. I've got some medicine here. I'm going to give this to you, and, and you're, you're going to be cured. You're, you're just going to be okay. And he smiled. And the, and the guy just started weeping. He, just, I mean, he was just weeping uncontrollably. And Dr. Brand turned to the truck, what did I say? What's wrong with him? And the guy turned and asked him. They talked for just a second. He turned back to the translator, turned to Dr. Brand. He said, Dr. Brand, it's okay. He just said, in all the years that he's had leprosy, you're the first person to touch him. He hadn't been touched in years. And hallelujah, Isn't isn't that what God has done for us? You know, in the Bible, leprosy is a picture of sin. And I mean, listen, we're just, we're, we're, we're covered in sin. And God reaches down. And listen, when we've ignored him and rejected him, and he reaches down in love. I like the way Max Lucado put it. I'll just close with this. He said, our Savior kneels down and gazes upon the darkest acts of our life. But rather than recoil in horror, he reaches out in kindness And he says, I can clean that if you want me to. And from the basin of his grace, he scoops a palm full of mercy. And he washes away our sin. Amen. I wish I had time. There's a passage. It would be a whole sermon by itself, and I'll close with this. Kindness is, listen, don't, don't. underestimate kindness. We look at all those love, joy, peace, patience. We say, man, those are, those are some, those are the biggies. Love, joy, peace, patience. Boy, those are biggies. Listen, kindness is a biggie too. Because here's the thing I want you to understand. This is a great verse. I'm going to give it to you in just a second. See, you ask people, how did you come to know Christ and why did you come? And so, listen, I was raised in it's where, you know, the preacher, a lot of times it was fire and brimstone. It was hell. And listen, hell is real and hell is hot. And I'm not trying to minimize that. Don't get me wrong. I'm just going to read you a verse and I'm going to show you something in just a second. But sometimes we have, and I was that way as a kid, I quaked in my boots. I didn't want to go to hell. And I, the fire and the brimstone and all of that stuff. And, and, and so sometimes we get so scared and, and we make decisions out of fear and so on and so forth. And sometimes that's okay and so on and so forth. But do you know that's not really God's plan? What is it that draws us to him? What is it that makes us want to give our heart and our life to him? Is it that I'm afraid of hell? Is it I'm afraid of I'm going to be consumed with fire and brim? Is that really it? No, that's not what it is. Listen to this verse and I'll be through. Romans 2 verse 4. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Now look at this. Can't you see that his kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Amen? It's His kindness. When we see the overwhelming love and grace and mercy and utter kindness of God the Father through Jesus Christ, it leads us to repentance. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Lord, for that. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for... uh, the fruit of the Spirit. And Lord, how much better our marriage would be, how much better our children would be, our our job situation, our situation at school, in the classroom, if we had love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. 
people today who need a kind word, who need a kind deed. Would you help us, Lord, to close our eyes to us? So many times our world, it just centers around us. And sometimes we don't even see the people who need that kind word. And most of all, those people who are unkind to us, people who say things about us, people who are rude to us, man, they need the kindness the most. Lord, that's what you've done to us. I pray you'd help us to do that to others. And even today and even this week, would you help us to be mindful of people all around us who need a kind word or a kind deed. And may we be obedient as we follow the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Lord, there may be someone here today that doesn't know you. No doubt in a room this size there are. They've never received you. They've never surrendered to you. And they've never received the Holy Spirit to even bear fruit. And so I pray that today they would see your kindness. <laughs> they would see your love. They would see your mercy and grace. And, and Lord, see that you're willing to cleanse that. You're willing to cleanse their sin today. And so I pray that they would make an eternal decision to yield their heart and their life to you today. Bless this invitation. Lord, may we be obedient to you as your spirit leads. Just pray you bind the enemy from us that we might hear from you and obey you today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask you to stand. And if you need to make